When Annie was little, she created a spare time machine. And thanks to it, she has fit more into her 18 years than most of us do into a lifetime. At Batavia High School, where she was an officer or member of the orchestra and many other clubs, honor societies, and volunteer opportunities, she received the Chronicle Achievement Program's $500 scholarship this May and spoke at graduation. Last year, she launched the, the Ethics of Teenage Persuasion. The Ethics of Teenage Perception, sorry. <laughs> dot com. An innovative website dedicated to artists inspiring and writing about other artists. She began writing seriously, and it's very cool. It, I, I think it's a really cool site. Um, she began writing seriously at the age of 10, when she lost her beloved father to cancer. Words poured out of her and filled page after page, and she has never stopped. As she enters DePaul University as a music journalism major this fall, we hope she will consider leaving the spare time machine at home and really concentrate on her true passions, music and writing. And, um, um, so what I'm gonna read tonight is a collection of short stories about my own life, um, which I've been writing for a long time, and finally they've um, form this collection, which I call Snails, and I'm going to read you the first chapter, which is about my dad. I'm going to skip a few parts and just read some short stories, but um, the first chapter is called Still Life, and this piece is called Vacancy. As I roamed down a bland hallway that looked like it hadn't seen a decent paint job since 1984, I peered into the doorways at house. I came to learn that these doorways held the most cut and dry outcomes. Blatantly speaking, it was either dying or surviving. Through these doorways, I saw those who were just waiting to be dragged out of their misery. I saw those who had become skin and bones as they graced a platform, so to say, just waiting for redemption. I saw those who were angelically comatose, staring outward with eyes placed over as if their bodies were already vacant. The bodies confined within these doorways would be the only tangible relics to prove that they had been there. However, it would be their legacy, whatever that may be, that would prevail. Legacy dictated by faith in fate. Faith in this idea that we are so constantly traveling where we are meant to be. It seems that eventually we will all travel in and out of these doorways. When we do travel out of these doorways, we'll cling to this idea that we're going to a better place. As machines keeping hearts beating and breaths breathing unplug, we watch the others close the doors behind them and hope the same. Unapologetic emptiness then fills the rooms, now vacant to the blind at heart. The cycle of vacancy and occupancy will start off once again, right where it left off. Yet I refuse to compel my faith in vacancy, in faith. This next piece is called An Extended Business Trip. I gazed into a new doorway as a quiet bystander that would go unseen. Words were not needed to tell me what was going on, for this time the sentences were clearly showcased, in a room where the only light was the chilling sun through the slim cracks of the blinds. In the room, a family surrounded a cancer patient. They all stared at him glossy-eyed. He was debilitated, for he could no longer speak. Then again, he did not need to. As mere words, could not combat the amount of pure adoration he had for all of them. The clock taunted him as it dictated the last minutes of his life. His eyes grew wide and awestruck. I knew he had to be seeing it, this place in the sky that this whole human race has been buzzing about. As two o'clock struck, a single tear flowed from his dry, elster eyes. I swear I saw his soul float up that day, but this could just be a, self, uh, a falsehood I self-comfort with. A hospice volunteer interrupted with a harsh and blunt whisper. He's dead. As I continued to witness this all floating outside my youthful body, I realized he wasn't actually dead because this wasn't living. When the sun set in his veins, I gave one last rub to that chemo-exhausted scalp of his, which felt like silky velvet. When his body did give out, I knew he'd shed all the petty human emotions that had come with it. I knew he'd exiled from pain that had previously stricken him to that mattress. Now as for my workaholic father, he'd, he'd be on what we'd refer to as an extended business trip. Every so often, I'd hope he'd walk in those four-year doors, 
and say hello. Instead, though, I write in postcards. I don't address them because I never know where they'll go. I know he gets them, though, every last single one of them. He's not gone. He's right over there. In saying so, I pointed to where I had objectified heaven to be, west of this forsaken town, beyond the stadium lights that surrounded us, towards the deep dimensionless structures, uh, clusters of stars and inner working galaxies, among structureless perfection. It was where the venomous mechanics of his disease could no longer hurt him, just past Venus. I knew he was there as I waved to the unrelenting great unknown. All right, I'm going to read a few more. This uh, next one is called Sidewalk Sentiments. I can remember flickering bright lights and the rarity of the yellow finch. I can remember listening to the water flow as I gazed at that ever-changing skyline. I can remember trying to find Venus and our light-polluted purple sky, and the sanctity of that one kiss page in my notebook. I remember the world as kaleidoscopic. I remember those stairs as I came back to school during the second week of fourth grade. I was amongst a wide-eyed audience who didn't know how to handle me. Who could blame them, though? We bled the innocence of youth, and honestly, I didn't know how to handle myself either. This was the real me shining through, full throttle. I was an evolving outcast, or so it felt like at the time. So naturally, I would start listening to punk rock music to cope with the loss of my father. It gave me an outlet to express my ever-fluctuating emotions. For the words of Billy Joe Armstrong and Joey Verone and other punk rockers could be so powerful and so prominent. I could connect with them, and it gave me a release, a sense that I wasn't alone, and this idea and capability to come out stronger from any hardship I might face down the line. No, music didn't fix everything, but damn, did it make things better. <laughs> this next one's called The Sea of Sunflowers. It was years later. The earth, my earth, I should say, was a decaying wasteland. It was a conceptualized desolation row. This was the world collapsing. It was like an atomic bomb unleashed hell on the city, which was unrecognizable at this point. There was no life to be seen except the sparkle or lack there of luster in a screen filled with pretty static. There is, in the distance, a tiny chapel. I ran to it in hopes of finding the divine light I had been searching for. I released the old weathered door from its hinges, hinges and burst it in, only to walk in on and interrupt a funeral. Around me, I am surrounded by strangers. They encompassed me as they robotically kneeled in the pews to pray to the patron saint of inhibition in which the man leading it all had preached about. Barry died in 2003 AD, began the leader man. The man in the casket was none other than my father. Barry was the man I designed vacuums that could suck out his cancer for. He was the man who called me out of school for an entire day so that we could go see a movie at the local cinema, take photographs at the photo booth near the shore, and sip on blue raspberry slushies, and blast the police with the sunroof down. The man was my idol. They didn't even know him. I screamed a deafening amount of obscenities as I ran out of that damned chapel with tears like daggers on my face. Out the doors, I gazed upward and walked slowly in awe. There was the light I was so frantically searching for. Life brought to the lifeless. It was like the Garden of Eden on a slightly breezy summer afternoon in June. From the ground sprung millions of sunflowers swarming all around me. Everything was no longer as grim as I had thought it to be when I was in those dark places. The world had light, light to guide the uninhibited soul onward. From the graves to the sunflowers that replaced them, the world was calm again. It was from that moment on that a tranquil sensation rushed my whole being. It implied this feeling that everything would be okay, for as long as the world had light, 
the light could guide me to the right place. It was time for me to let the flowers after death bloom and bloom all around me. As you can tell, I, I have a lot to say all the time. <laughs> but I'm just going to read this one last piece. Um, it's called Medium Rare. When my life seemed to get a little too tumultuous, the yellow finches seemed to swarm. Whether it was in the rafters of that old abandoned barn or silhouetted on the blazing sun, they always brought my heart back to ease. When the finches soared beyond my horizon, my father would come to me in dreams or in the form of so-called stand-ins. These stand-in fathers have been there for me when I needed them most and range anywhere from rock and roll, car, and English enthusiasts, some of whom are in the audience tonight. I just wanted to say that if my father was here tonight, he'd stand in his leather cowboy boots with a warm Dr. Pepper with lemon in hand and say, man, you are doing me one hell of a favor. Thank you.